thank you very much, Dr. Wesson. I appreciate you being here this evening. I would like to reconvene the meeting from the closed session and call this meeting to order for the City Council meeting of February 15, 2022. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll and make an announcement about accessing the meeting? In order to participate in the City Council meeting virtually, please register to speak using the link on the agenda under public comment or call 1-669-900-91. And use webinar ID number 833-4127-8926. To raise your hand to speak on a particular agenda item, please use the raise hand button in the Zoom meeting portal. If you are, raising, if you are using the telephone, please press star 9 on your telephone keypad to raise your hand to speak. Press star 6 to unmute your phone. When it is your time to speak, your microphone will be unmuted for the time allotted by the mayor and will be muted upon completion of your comments. Uh, Council Member Cordero. Here. Council Member Escobedo. Here. Council Member Soto. Here. Council Member Waterfield. Present. And Madam Mayor Patino. Here. City Attorney, Mr. Watson, would you please give the closed session report? Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, with respect to the case that was noticed as Rust versus City of Santa Maria, uh, the council unanimously approved a settlement proposal offered by the plaintiff. No further report. Thank you. First item this evening is retirement resolution, and Council Member Cordero will be, will be making the presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, did you want to say anything, Jesse? Yes. Jesse? Afterwards. Oh, afterwards, okay. Uh, this is a, a retirement for Vaughn de Gamore, and um, I, I have to say that I've read many of these. <laughs> Something in my eye here. I've read many of these. Uh, it's kind of like watching your children uh, graduate and go to college and whatnot. And what makes this one with Vaughn so special is five years ago, and it just seems like it was just the other day, uh, she came to work for the San Ray Police Department, and I don't really remember whether she, we worked together her first day or not, but very soon thereafter, we started working together. And then uh, Vonda went off and got herself pregnant. So we watched that happen, uh, and that's <coughs> not quite a novelty at a police department, but it's, it's, a, it's a little different to watch the the, the process of, of uh, pregnancy, and you know, she as she steadily moved back from the microphone as she got bigger and bigger, and and then she had her babies, and I, I remember going to her house to welcome the babies, and there they sit, a pair of twins, and I don't remember which one I held, but I held one of them like this, and here they are sitting next to her as young women, so it's special for me. So, I read this. This is a resolution number 20, uh, from 2022-14. Whereas Vonda Damore has been employed by and faithfully served the city of Santa Maria since October the 6th, 1997, as a dedicated public servant, exemplifying service, professionalism, and dedication to the law enforcement profession. And whereas Vonda spent her public safety career with the city as a training coordinator, dispatcher, and senior dispatcher. And whereas Vonda, uh, Vonda's calm and <laughs> professional demeanor uh, while on the radio and 911 calls uh, was exemplified by her uh, comments to serve the public and the compassion and professionalism. And whereas Vonda Demore's Commitment and devotion to duty have contributed measurably to the quality of life that residents, business, businesses, and visitors enjoy in Santa Maria. Now, therefore, it is hereby resolved by the City Council of the City of Santa Maria as follows. Vonda Damore is commended for her faithful, as distinguished, and devoted to service to the Santa Maria community and is congratulated on her retirement. And she and her family are wished good health and many happy years of happiness. Passed and adopted, 
at the regular meeting of the City of San Maria City Council held on the 15th day of February 2022 and signed by the mayor and all the council members. And I make this, I read this in the form of a motion, Madam Mayor. Madam mayor. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. And yeah. Any other discussion? Hearing none, Madam Kirk, could you please call the roll? Council Member Cordero? Aye. Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Council Member Soto? Aye. Council Member Escobedo? Aye. And Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. And Vonda, would you like to make any comments? Last 25 years, as uh, Councilman Cordero had mentioned, uh, Vonda Demore has been a staple in our in our communication center in our department. Uh, she's answered countless incoming calls. She's dispatched both police and, and fire to literally thousands of calls for service. Uh, she's been a trainer, as uh, Councilman Cordero mentioned, and a mentor to her fellow dispatchers, and frequently the go-to person for her peers and also her supervisors. Um, dispatchers, in my opinion, are often the unsung heroes. In, uh, in our profession and don't always get the recognition that they need uh, or deserve. Um, but that said, on behalf of Chief Schneider, who couldn't be here today, Santa Maria Police Department, the Santa Maria Fire Department, and the City of Santa Maria, I want to thank uh, Bonda for all her hard work and dedication to the uh, Santa Maria Police Department and uh, the City of Santa Maria. We wish her well and, um, and all the best in uh, her well-deserved retirement. So congratulations. <laughs> It's okay, I'll take off the mask because I'm not used to talking on the radio Absolutely. The phone without the mask. But I'll keep it right here, just in case. <laughs> anyway, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to council. I've talked to the Lieutenant Cordero, retired, Mayor Patino. I've talked to you a couple times on the phone. I've talked to you, madam. I've talked to a few. So over the years, you've always supported us, and I appreciate that. I thank the fire department for coming. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I appreciate all the citizens for coming and supporting council because, you know, without you guys, the city doesn't move forward. And Pastor, you for your, for your prayer, thank you very much. It's, it's a, not an easy job to be a dispatcher. I've worked graveyards, I think at least 10 years. As long as they've been alive, they just turned 15 in January. I've worked holidays, I've worked major events, I've worked things that probably most people don't want to, you know, work. But it's been a great job, and I appreciate everything that you guys have done. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much, Vonda, for your hard work. And I you know, I don't, I don't think people realize how difficult the job of a dispatcher is because not everyone, probably only one person in this room could actually do it because it is a very difficult and demanding job. But thank you very much for your hard work. The city and to have it. twins on top of that to do it. I have twins, so I know that it's not an easy task. Next, we have a presentation of the Businesses of the Month. Mr. Morris, good evening. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council, and uh, members of the public that are here this evening. It's an honor to be back with you again this month uh, to share with you and introduce to you our, our two businesses of the month uh, for, for the month of February. Uh, as we've mentioned in the past of uh, this year, we are focusing our recognition on um, women-owned businesses and uh, manufacturers in our community. Um, those are very different categories, but uh, we think that they really um, help us to highlight um, what 
you know, some of our major employers are, as well as some of our really creative and unique businesses are uh, in the community. So let me introduce our first business tonight, and that's Neuroboxing Santa Maria. Uh, Neuroboxing Santa Maria is a non-contact boxing and functional exercise program that enables people with certain neurological conditions, like Parkinson's disease, to fight back by providing a lifestyle fitness program designed to combat the symptoms of their condition um, and to improve the quality of their lives. Neuroboxing Santa Maria provides a fun, encouraging environment through a tough love approach to help with muscle rigidity, voice, balance, coordination, and much more. In 2017, April started uh, the program with two fighters and three classes uh, a week. She calls her customers fighters, just to be clear on that, in, in a small space here in Santa Maria. Over the years, uh, through outreach and, and working with local doctors, the program has grown to an average of 25 to 30 fighters and six classes a week, and they now operate out of a, a beautiful, dedicated gym space at Marion Hospital's Health and Wellness Center. In 2019, Neuroboxing transitioned to become a nonprofit, so they're able to uh, provide more community um, events and opportunities for those living with neurological conditions. As you can imagine, with COVID, uh, Neuroboxing had to make a, a number of adjustments. Classes went fully online in March of 2020 and continued that way for several months until they were able to develop uh, the protocols to be able to safely um, uh, conduct their classes using physical distancing, PPE, cleaning protocols, and temperature monitoring. In addition to operating the, uh, the uh, neuroboxing program, April is also president of Central Coast Parkinson's Association, uh, which works with the local community and doctors in our region to provide services and education across the Central Coast about these um, neurological conditions. April is a certified personal trainer who holds certifications in neuroboxing, rock steady boxing, box and burn, uh, senior fitness, and urban pole walking. Um, if any of you are looking for an interesting Saturday afternoon, perhaps she would demonstrate or, or take you on an urban pole walk. Um, at least I want to go watch. Uh, so with that, Mayor and members of the council, would you uh, join me in welcoming April Sargent, the owner of Neuroboxing Santa Maria. Thank you. I'm going to explain that urban pole walking thing. Uh, so what that is, is um, urban pole walking is a branded version of poles, and it's like Nordic pole walking, but they've made poles specifically for people with balance and neurological issues, and they certify those of us that are uh, um, trainers in that. So we can sell those poles, and we can do, you know, events and exercises and that kind of stuff. So I do offer community events for that once a month from April to October. I open them up to anybody. You don't have to have a neurological condition to join us. Um, it's a lot of fun. We do the exercise and then we go out in the wild and do walking with these poles and stuff. Um, so that's, that's that. <laughs> if anybody wants to do it, it's really fun and I'm willing to take you. Um, but thank you very much for, for this honor. I'm really excited. Um, in addition to Parkinson's, I have expanded with um, Falling under the umbrella of neuroboxing, I can help strokes, ALS, MS, um, PSP, um, early onset Alzheimer's. So if you know anybody with any of these conditions, um, I'm always willing to talk to somebody. I'm always willing to look for doctors that are willing to refer their clients. It makes a huge difference in the lives of these people. You have people that couldn't get up out of a chair before that can get up, up and down off the floor now. Or people who can write their name that can write their name now. It's an amazing thing that happens when, when they're the right um, exercises are worked, worked with these neurological conditions. So if anybody's ever interested in volunteering or coming and watching a class or bringing somebody, like my phone number's out there, just call me. I'm willing to talk to anybody. So thank you so much. Thank you. With that, um, we'd like to present you with a certificate which recognizes Neuroboxing Santa Maria as a featured women-owned business for February 22. This certificate is awarded by the City of Santa Maria and the Santa Maria Valley Chamber of Commerce to Neuroboxing Santa Maria for their excellence in community relationships and support and in making Santa Maria a great place to live and work and do business. I think this is fantastic. <laughs> wow. I have a question for her. 
Uh, one minute. Uh, Mr. Cordero has a question. Yes. Do, do you do things with people that not only have those neurological issues, but people that have had um, injuries? Uh, traumatic brain injuries, yes. So if somebody's right. had like a traumatic brain injury from a car accident or a, or a fall or anything like that, that is helpful as well. The, the program that we use can, can follow those. Okay. Um, so yeah, is that what you meant? Uh, no, I meant just like a, a fall and, and then suffering for years without balance. So if you have a diagnosed balance issue, then yeah, we can talk. But generally, you have to have a diagnosed neurological condition um, for, to be accepted in the program. But there are exceptions I have made, um, depending upon the situation. So I, I welcome a phone call if, if okay. you know something. Well, I just Fantastic. wondered. Yeah. Thank you. Madame, you? Yes. Mr. Cordero. Oh. Oh. Mr. <laughs> yes. Sure. Thank you. Uh, just want to let you know that I'm one of you on Facebook. I've seen uh, your hard work and uh, April. I think it's uh, always with great energy. I've seen those videos that you post. I'm really grateful to have people like you in the community and organization like yours. And say thank you. Thank you so much and yeah. keep working f hard. Thank you. Yeah, if anybody wants to f you know, find Facebook, I'm on there and I post lots of videos and stuff like that. I never mind. Like that. and follow. <laughs> yeah, I'm a <remember. laughs> So, April, I'd like to say that's not what I thought of Paul I thought it was, you know, one of these no, tall no, buildings we stretch a pole across, and so that sounds safer. <laughs> it's not stilts, right? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not high walking right across <laughs> tall buildings. Um, so, our second business, our manufacturing um, business of the month this month is Atlas Copco Mafi Trench. Uh, they provide world-leading, innovative industrial solutions. Uh, in the turbo machinery air arena for renewable energy production, liquefied natural gas, chemical and petrochemical processes, and hydrogen processes. The business was started in 1975 and arrived in Santa Maria in 1981 with 50 employees. Today they employ 216 people in Santa Maria. The company recently created a new uh, fast delivery machine for the natural gas boom which resulted in more than a hundred orders of over a million dollars each. Currently, they are doing R&D on improved machines for the growing hydrogen production market. So very much at the uh, forefront of their industry. Atlas Copco buys many products and services locally and estimates that their contribution to the Santa Maria economy exceeds $10 million annually. The majority of their customers are international, who then have to visit Santa Maria for testing of their equipment and to, to interact with the, the, the team. Uh, they are currently pursuing the Green Business Certification from the California Green Business Network. Uh, they have employees who teach at both Allen Hancock and Cal Poly. And so they support local high school trollers and programs to encourage young people in seeking careers in manufacturing. Uh, they're currently offering up to eight internships per year, and they pay people who want to come to work for them so that they'll move to Santa Maria. Atlas Copco Mafi Trench is uh, grateful for the support of the city over the many years and uh, they wanted me to, to, to remind us that, that although the planned new factory that they were going to build a few years ago hasn't occurred yet, um, there was a little recession that got in the way there a few years ago, uh, they, they say the hope is not dead and they hope they look forward in the next three to four years to uh, working with the city to help convince their corporate bosses uh, that it's time to build a new factory in Santa Maria to uh, expand their business even further. Um, so with that, Mayor, I'd like to introduce Randy Durlam, Project Management and Packaging Manager, and Dina Malloy, the Engineering Manager for Atlas Copco Mafi Trench. Glenn, Good evening. thank you so much. We greatly appreciate uh, having a moment here. 41 years is uh, a blink. I've worked at Mafi Trench for 33 years, and I speak at Cal Poly. I've been teaching there for about 10, 12, 15 years. I can't remember. And I always tell the students, I said, I know you drive through Santa Maria, but did you know the world's leading technology provider of hydrocarbon turbo expanders is in Santa excuse, excuse me, I need to have you speak into the mic. Oh, sorry, thank you. Sorry I didn't interrupt you. <laughs> and they said, what? And I'm like, the world-leading supplier is in Santa Maria. 
not from California, not the U.S., the world. And that has been a great draw. We bring in uh, interns, we keep people locally, we're able to hire uh, engineers locally um, and have done so for many years. So we're greatly appreciative of the opportunities here. Uh, in, in, in being in manufacturing, it's not a popular thing to do, and yet we have been contributing positively 70 to 80 percent of our business, which when we started here was about five million a year. Now it, it routinely is about 100 million a year. And 70, 80 percent of that is international uh, sales. So we are a net exporter. So we're really proud of being an American manufacturing company that produces goods to the world, not just locally. So for that, we're greatly appreciative. Dean, I don't know if you want to say anything. She's a, no. Dean is our engineering manager. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. And we're, um, we're again, happy to be here and happy to be in Santa Maria. So I have a question for you. To have you. So when you export, do you have to take your product down to LAX to export it out? So our, our shipments are so large, we're using the ports. Uh, these okay. are 40, 50, 60,000 pound wow. shipments. These are uh, substantially large. So are they taken by railway? No, this is trucked into the ports. Mm -hmm. And so we've been suffering with the LA port yeah. problem now for the last year. I bet. Well before the news found it, we've been suffering with it. So <laughs> You're still on Industrial Parkway? We sure are. Yeah. Oh, wow, we I've been there for are. a while. Uh, yeah, since, uh, <laughs> since we started, 81. Well, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> and I just want to present the certificate that recognizes Alice Copco Moffey Trench Company as the featured manufacturing business for February 22. This, is, this certificate is awarded by the City of Santa Maria and the Santa Maria Valley Chamber of Commerce to Atlas Copco Moffey Trench Company for their excellence in community leadership and support in making Santa Maria a great place to live, work, and do business. And I remember you very well from the good old EDA days, Santa Maria Valley EDA days with yeah, Rob Boyster yeah. and all those. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, you, you've been very good to us, and hmm. I thank you. Say something, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Brandy, wait, 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 wait! You can't get away so fast. Mr. Cordero has a question. Randy, uh, um, I'm, I'm on my third term on the council, and we get invited to um, various things, to tour things from time to time throughout, throughout the year. And several years ago, uh, we were invited to Moffey Trench. Uh -huh. And I've been here for a long time. And uh, I, had, I had no idea what it was. No idea. It, I, like probably other people, I thought they were in the business of digging trenches. Yep, that's the <laughs> first um, thought. I, 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 I went over there and saw all this machinery and all this aluminum and uh, I did a little bit of that work, N nothing remotely close to what you're doing, but I, I, I knew about the, the, the lathes and the milling and all of that kind of stuff. And, and I cannot remember ever going to a tour that I was more impressed with <laughs> than what you guys were doing and the, and, the, and the, I couldn't imagine putting something together without a gasket of some kind. And you guys do it just metal to metal. And I thought, it just can't be done. And uh, it, it was just amazing what you folks uh, put together out there. And in my circle, I often have mentioned that tour and that, uh, recommended to people that they should look into something like that. And, and I'm really, personally, just glad to have you around here. I didn't know it was the world's largest uh, yeah, and most advanced. 2005. But I just think it was just absolutely fantastic to be out there. Appreciate that. Thank you. And, and tours are always available. We're happy to host. Uh, we have STEM students come probably, well, not in the last two years, but prior to that, we're always hosting STEM students. And so uh, the technology is pretty amazing to see. So. Well, just thank you very, thank you very, very much. Yeah, appreciate thank you. Very, it. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.
Our next item this evening is a proclamation and I will be making that presentation. Whereas the Future Farmers of America, FFA, and the agricultural education provide a strong foundation for the youth of America and the future of food, fiber, and natural resources systems. And whereas FFA promotes premier leadership, personal growth, and career success among its members. And whereas agricultural education and the FFA ensure a steady supply of young professionals to meet the growing demands in the science, business, and technology of agriculture. And whereas the FFA motto, learning to do, doing to learn, earning to live, living to serve, gives direction of purpose to these students who take an active role in succeeding in agricultural education. And whereas FFA promotes citizenship, volunteerism, patriotism, and cooperation. Now therefore I, Alison Patino, Mayor of the City of Santa Maria, do hereby recognize the week of February 19th through February 25th, 2022 as Future Farmers of America Week in the City of Santa Maria and encourage awareness of the program and its opportunities for youth. In witness thereof, I have hereby set my hand and caused the seal of the City of Santa Maria to be affixed this 15th day of February, 2022. And I, I want to say that I my, both of my boys were involved in FFA, and each one of them was on the Ag, Meta Ag Mechanics team that won the state finals, and this had to be back in the 80s. And I also went back to Kansas City when they did the national finals back there. And it's so impressive over the years when I've seen all of these kids and the programs that they come through and the leadership skills that it builds in these young people. It's not just about animals or growing a plant. It's about the whole person. And it's it's very, very impressive. And I am so proud to be reading this tonight. And we have uh, future farmers here from Santa Maria High School. Thank you for having us today. We would like to proclaim next week as National FFA Week. National FFA Week is celebrated in February, the week of Washington's birthday. The Santa Maria FFA has been in the FFA chapter since 1932 and is now the largest chapter in California with 1,100 members. This next week, to celebrate the National FFA Week, our Santa Maria FFA chapter is going to be hosting lunch activities for our FFA members to participate in. Now passing it on to Eric Ceja to introduce those activities. First and foremost, I want to say thank you for having us here. Um, so National FFA Week, we're, on Tuesday we're going to be having What Would You Eat for $20, where our passionate FFA members will be eating anything that's poured into their cups, and the last man standing will win the $20. <laughs> <laughs> and then on Wednesday, we're going to be having obstacle course and tug of war, where they will be competing to see who has the fastest times. On Thursday, we'll have Got a Book, You're in Luck, which is personally one of my favorites, because we like, we like to give back to our students. So just imagine $1 for a nice barbecue burger, some chips, and a drink for only $1. So, it's a good deal. And then Friday, we're going to have tractor pull where our strong FFA members are going to be pulling a tractor for 100 feet. To, and they're going to be timed, so whoever has a fast time will eventually win. I just want to say thank you once again for having us here, and we would like personally to invite you guys to our fun FFA activities. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to. Mr. Gary? <laughs> You want to say anything, Mr. Gare? Uh, just uh, thank you. And in, in regards to the National Convention, uh, I was there with, with you along and uh, your family. Uh, John, uh, we were in school at the same time. I went to Reggae at, uh, from Santa Maria. And so that was a neat trip. I still remember that. Great trip. So here you go. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Escobedo. 
Yeah, I just, uh, just want to congratulate the FFA and uh, Mr. Gara. I've I had worked with so many FFA students and the leadership skills they develop. I mean, you know, aside from from all the great job they're uh, doing by learning how to grow, how to uh, how to serve, how to be leaders, I think that's uh, just invaluable. And I want to recognize the hard work I've seen it uh, through generations already. And yeah, just. Uh, even uh, they were part of Open Streets in 2019. They displayed a great uh, area. And yeah, thank you for your hard work and looking forward to, to see more success. And it's always great to, especially, I'm really impressed by the way that you guys display. Uh, last time I went to, uh, it was on party night, you guys got this tractor there. Everybody was putting tables. But the FFA team was with a tractor, all set up, a great display. So that, that talks that you guys really take uh, uh, your professional. So that, that's really great. So looking forward to see you guys growing that chapter. And thank you for what you do, not just in the classroom, but also in the community. May I? Thank you. Yes, Ms. Soto. Um, as an FFA um, alum, <laughs> I want to really highlight the work of of all of the FFA chapters in Santa Maria within the districts. And so congratulations and thank you for presenting today. And please feel free to um, invite us to your annual end of the year banquets. Those are always so fun and it's a great fundraiser. Um, so please um, invite us. <laughs> thank you. So the next item this evening is another proclamation and Council Member Soto will be making the presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this proclamation is in honor of International Women's Day. Whereas International Women's Day was first honored in Austria, Denmark, Germany, Switzerland in 1911, and whereas in 1977, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution calling on member states to proclaim a day for women's rights and international peace. And each year issues a proclamation calling on all citizens to observe March as National Women's History Month. And whereas International Women's Day is observed around the world and provides an opportunity to recognize and reflect on the progress made to advance women's equality, to celebrate the gains made by women in our society, and to reflect on the challenges and barrier, barriers which women continue to face. And whereas women's access to education, health care, and paid labor has improved and legislation that promises equal opportunities for women and respect for their human rights has been adopted in many countries. Now, therefore, the mayor, Alice Patino of the city of Santa Maria, hereby recognizes March 8, 2022, as International Women's Day in the city of Santa Maria and encourages our residents and businesses to celebrate with the appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. And here to accept the proclamation is Santa Maria's Women's Network. Hi, um, my name is Erica Weber. I am this year's president of the Santa Maria Women's Network, and this is my VP, Naomi Altergott. And first of all, hi, Alice. Hi. Um, it's, um, it's really an honor to be that the Women's Network, the Santa Maria Women's Network, has been chosen to represent all the amazing women in this community. So many, I mean, we specifically try to encourage women in business, and we support them, and we try to help them learn tips and tricks for growing their business or being better at what they do. But but there's women in, that are just being amazing moms and just being amazing community leaders and just, well, not just, but, you know, doing things behind the scenes that we don't see, but they should be recognized and honored as well. And so it's really quite, quite an honor. And I think we even have some of our members on the Zoom call supporting us as well because it, it's a collaborative effort and we're really honored to be receiving this proclamation. Yeah, hi.
Next we oh. <laughs> Next we have the public comment period. Madam Clerk, could you please read the criteria for the public comment portion of the agenda? This time is reserved to accept comments from the public on consent agenda items, closed session items, or matters not otherwise scheduled on the printed agenda this evening. Unless otherwise directed by the mayor, speakers will have three minutes to comment. Direction to staff may be given. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, state law does not allow action to be taken on matters not on the printed agenda this evening. Once the public comment period commences, no other speakers will be allowed to submit a request to speak for them. Madam Mayor, we uh, received two written uh, communications from Jesse White expressing concerns over increasing gang activity at the mall and uh, Mr. Joseph Skoda who provided a signature petition and photos to the city council. And um, he's on our Zoom this evening and he can explain more when we hear from Zoom speakers, but in, in chambers, we have five speakers. Uh, Thank you. Okay, this will be three minutes apiece. I have Jesse White, followed by Eileen Encinas, followed by Gary Hall. Yes. No. Oh, oh. Oh, okay. I don't have a I don't have a slip for him. Okay. Oh, oh, you can bring it on up, Dr. Wesson. That'll be fine. Yeah. Okay, Jesse White, followed by Eileen Encinas. Good evening, Mr. White. Good evening, um, everybody. First time speaking, so bear with me. Um, I'm the owner of Get Socked Up in the Santa Maria Town Center Mall. I, I do own other stores, but I, I own the one that is here across the street. Um, I wanted to bring to attention that we're not really getting the support that we need from law enforcement um, in the mall. Um, I am starting to see in the parking structure. Um, and, Right when I moved into the mall and opened my business, um, I started seeing issues of not getting support. I did have a, my first issue of not getting support on um, December of 2020, when I had a man under the influence come into my store, charge him in my back room, and threaten to kill me. Um, I reported it to the police department immediately. Um, the police department called me back and told me, unless he described exactly how he was gonna kill you, there's nothing we can do, and wouldn't even come to my store. Um, just in the last month since I've been in the mall, just in the last month, I've seen fights break out, a uh, security guard in his 60s jumped by three teenagers, teens smashing the glass out of a vending machine when asked to leave the mall, um, property destruction, vandalism, groups of gang-affiliated teens harassing and intimidating other teens and adults. Um, we even had an issue last week where the teens went in the hallway and shut down the power to the building, um, which caused us to have to evacuate our stores. Um, shoplifting, smoking marijuana in the halls, um, and these are just the criminal activities. These aren't the things that they're doing that are disrupting our businesses. I even had an issue on Wednesday um, where there was a group of teens that were being disruptive in the mall. Security had called the police, let them know they were trespassing and they wanted them removed. Um, and cite them. Um, my employee sent me a video saying, hey, it's escalating, do you want me to shut down the store? Three girls saw her videoing and went in the store, started cussing out my employee and getting in her face. She's a 45-year-old woman going through cancer treatment. I immediately told her to hang up and call the police. Um, an hour later, there were no police. I called the police department. They let me know it was low priority and no one ever came, ever came to my store, even though she was being threatened. Um, I just feel like the town center is slipping through the cracks and we're seeing escalated violence and criminal activity among the teens. I just don't want to see anybody get hurt. I had made a comment on the police department's social media page three days before the shooting and the structure. Please take part in what's happening here. We need your help. Somebody's going to end up dying. Three days later, somebody was shot and killed in that parking structure, even after my warning. 
I don't want to see a kid killed. I don't want to see one of my employees killed. And it's getting scary. We need your help. We need the police department's help. We need involvement. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to address. Thank you, Mr. White. That will, that will be taken <clears throat> care of. Get sucked up. Thank you very much. Ms. Ms. Encinas, followed by Gary Hall. Madam Mayor and Council Members, um, I didn't come prepared or, or make a written speech that I was going to speak tonight. I'm speaking from how I feel. I'm so passionate about either renewing the model lease and fixing it or an ordinance. And the reason why is that I live in La Maria Mobile Home Park. It's a senior park and it's an older park with a lot of people who don't have a lot of income. The park was sold in approximately 2013 thereabouts to an LLC, a corporation, and the bottom line is their profits. And the unbalance of power between the owners and the park, the lease people, is immense. Um, they changed how they raised the rents. The, at their discretion, our mobile rents, if somebody sells, goes up 10%, and then the next year it goes up again by the CPA, CPI of LA. Not everybody's rent is raised the same amount or the same time during the year. Mine was raised in December and mine only went up 3%. My neighbors who get raised in the spring, theirs went up 7.5%. For a single wide mobile home, this is an old park. These people have bought these homes, they can't buy anything else, and there's no protection for them because my owner chose not to sign on to your model lease program. And so he controls it. They do very little. We don't have garages. We have carports. You have people who pay 1025 a month. Single wives with a small plot of lease land pay 900 950 depending on how many times the place has been sold mm -hmm. and the time of year the rent is increased. And I see these seniors, uh, my husband and I are not really hard off. We, we, and it, it just hits in my heart to see these people who are living on a small amount of money per month and not have enough and thinking about leaving. I had a gentleman who's 80 the other day and we were talking and he says, I, I just can't afford it anymore. Another lady I know moved to Tennessee because the rents are so high and ours are higher than a lot of the other newer mobile home parks. I have a friend in Cuello Meadows that I walk with at Waller Park. Her rent is even less than my rent and I pay about 800. Most of the people pay eight, 900, 1,025 for the people who lost their home mobile home in a fire. And, and that's why I want to see some help for these people. This is your affordable housing. Where else can you live for that amount of money? And they've already bought the mobile home, so they can't afford to go out and buy another one. Thank you. Thank you. Gary Hall, followed by Andrea Mayfield. Good evening, Madam, <clears throat> excuse me, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Gary Hall. I'm a resident of Rancho Buena Vista Mobile Estates and I represent the North Santa Barbara County Mobile Homeowners Team. I'm going to read to you an excerpt from a document in the City of Santa Maria Archives. In quotes, a growing shortage of housing units resulting in a critically low vacancy rate and rapidly rising and exorbitant rents Exploiting this shortage constitutes serious housing problems affecting a substantial portion of the Santa Maria residents who reside in mobile home rental housing. These conditions endanger the public health and welfare of the city of Santa Maria. Especially acute is the problem of rapidly rising and exorbitant rents in mobile home parks in the city of Santa Maria. Due to such factors and the high cost of moving mobile homes, the potential for damage from moving mobile homes, the lack of alternative home sites for mobile home residents and the substantial investment of mobile home owners in such homes. The city council finds and declares it necessary to protect the owners 
and occupiers of mobile homes from unreasonable rents while at the same time recognizing the need for mobile home park owners to receive a fair rate of return. The purpose of this chapter is to alleviate the hardship caused by this problem by imposing rent controls in mobile home parks in Santa Maria. As best I can determine, this is from the October 1999 unadopted ordinance number 99-18 titled Mobile Home Rent Control. It's amazing that we are here 21 years and five months later with conditions described in that document remaining basically the same. And we still are fighting the same battle. Two weeks ago, I read to you a list of Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, and Ventura County cities, a list of cities where their mobile home residents enjoy rent protection provided by city governments that were willing to act and protect their citizens. They were willing to stand with their taxpaying citizens in their time of need. Now, where is Santa Maria? Mobile home residents are here again tonight in hopes that you will acknowledge our appeals and do the right thing by adding mobile home rent stabilization to the agenda of future meetings. It's time to either fix and renegotiate the model lease and enforcement agreement or consider our proposed 2019 mobile home rent stabilization ordinance. The mobile home residents of Santa Maria need and deserve your help. You have a real chance to provide that help and protect mobile home space affordability. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea Mayfield, followed by Lydia Marine. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, all I have to say to begin with to, uh, to you all is ditto Gary Hall. I am here also to uh, advocate for either fixing the model lease for our mobile home owners in, in uh, Santa Maria or addressing the rent stabilization ordinance. I was on a Zoom call yesterday uh, with the North County Coalition. I'm sure you all are aware of that group. On the call, there were 18 representatives of various organizations that give voice to the underrepresented in the city. Now, I know some of them were also uh, attended the goal setting uh, meeting that, that y'all had on Friday. Um, in the group conversation yesterday, it was, we had unanimous agreement that affordable housing was a very, my glasses fog up, was a very, very important topic um, in Santa Maria. And we're not talking about affordable for middle income folks. We're not talking about affordable for households that have two incomes. We're talking about folks, seniors, who live on a fixed income of Social Security. We're talking about the very, very poor and underemployed folks in the city. Affordable housing is critical for them and for the city. While we were having a conversation about zoning and uh, finding grants for construction and uh, the various criteria for uh, tax relief for owners and construction folks, it dawned on me, it's like, wait, you all have the power right now to provide rent stabilization for an entire population in Santa Maria. It's all those folks who live in mobile home parks, those seniors on, on a fixed income, those low income families with one or two parents working, but still struggle to get by every day. So I implore you, you have the power. Nike said it best, let's just do this. Thank you. Thank you. Lydia Marine followed by Dr. Wesson. Hello, this is my first time speaking here, so I'm a little bit nervous. But I'm a resident of Santa Maria for about 40 years. And I just recently started sitting in on here because I hear things 
that are very upsetting to our city. Just recently in one of these meetings, I heard Councilwoman Soto mention how she would promote Roe versus Wade, which is an aborting and a killing of babies. None of us would be here if our mothers made that decision. So what makes us more important than that baby who may be sitting here in your seat? You may not know, or you probably do know, that Norma McCorvey, who started Roe versus Wade, was very regretful about doing so. She converted to Catholicism, which is against abortion. That is one of the things that brought me to this table. The other uh, topics that are mentioned are a little bit lighter, uh, which is housing of the homeless, if I can bring that up. Um, my son and I were just talking about it, and one of the ideas is maybe bring corporation leaders to a table, not just a council, but corporation leadership to the table and see what they can suggest, what they can help with uh, to maybe build uh, some place away from housing that would devalue homes or that would, um, uh, you know, be near schools. You don't want them near the schools. You don't know uh, what their background is. You don't know how they got into this situation. Some are very good, we know this, but some can cause problems. So that was one idea, maybe build away from uh, the homes, maybe in industrial areas, uh, try that. Another thing is give them jobs, easy jobs. Say you have 10 homeless people, two people accept the jobs, that's two people off the street out of 10. Again, you try again, two more people off the street. Give them uh, jobs like, uh, beautification of the city, picking up trash. I go by the freeway, on the outside of the freeway, over by roadhouses or McDonald's, there's always paper and trash up against there. So that's an idea. Give them little jobs to do. Some may take it, some may not, but it might be a start. And the other thing is the city budget. Again, some of the money that you might be able to spend is to fix up the older part of Santa Maria and help the smaller businesses that have lost some of their uh, business during this pandemic. Uh, Main Street would be a good place to start uh, painting, uh, fixing up the front, putting some plants in front, making it look like a business you want to go to. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Wesson? Again, thank you. Um, about a year and seven months ago, the alley of Courier and Miller, um, the water lines were replaced. They replaced the lines, redone the alley. They changed our meter, but none of the homes were changed. Since that happened, we've been paying $1,700 in water. And no matter how much I call here to talk to them about it, we don't get answers. They sent the inspector out. He came out, took a look at what was going on. He said it was literally impossible. We still had to pay the bill. Now they say it's inside our building. Somewhere there's a leak in the building. He came out, inspected the building, found nothing. Now we're paying $900 for inside the building. And I'm at wit's end of what to do here. And if the council can't help us, then it turns into a legal matter because we don't have, you know, $2,600 every month to pay out on some water. We're still in COVID. And nobody's there during the week other than myself. So how do we spend this much money or use that much water to be charged this much? And I'd just like to get some answers and get this resolved. We will have someone contact you, Dr. Wesson. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any written comments or speakers this evening? Uh, Madam Mayor, I already mentioned the comments, um, the one from uh, Jesse White and okay. then also from uh, Mr. Skoda. We do have uh, two speakers with their hands up on Zoom, um, first being uh, Denise Sullivan. Okay. Ms. Sullivan. 
Yes. Okay. Um, hi, I just wanted to say thank you to the city council members um, for allowing me the time to address my concerns. I just wanted to ask what is actually being done about the homeless population here in Santa Maria. Um, it saddens me to hear that council member Etta Waterfield and Mayor Alicia Patino are going out of their way to make it harder for human beings who are at the worst point in their lives have a roof over their head with this new Motel 6 project that is said to be 60 units of low-income housing for Santa Maria's most vulnerable population, homeless seniors and transitional youth. If you guys don't like the look of homelessness, well, we should do something about it. If you're concerned that the Motel 6 project will give a bad look to tourists coming into Santa Maria, what about the encampments on, on uh, 101 Main Street exit? Um, Santa Maria homeless population is growing every day and there's not enough resources. There's just one shelter in this town and it's currently only accepting family and vets and they're capped at 50. Where do you want these people to go? You think that because they refuse services that they don't want to better their lives, but that's just not true. It's hard for people to go into shelter and follow strict rules after they've been on the streets dealing with substance abuse and mental health problems. We need a low barrier shelter with the harm reduction model that actually allows these people to succeed and have options besides the one shelter in town or the streets. If you're worried about the police calls, it's just gonna get worse if we do nothing. I find it absolutely inhumane that there's a riverbed cleanup going on right now and the city isn't offering resources like shelter beds if they're willing to go just because of the Santa Maria River is over the county line. There are over a hundred people in the riverbed and they've been, and they're there because they're kicked out of town and they're told to go to the riverbed. Now with this cleanup, they're gonna end up back in town with their stuff thrown, thrown away and they're gonna be angry and they're gonna end up back in the riverbed. All that taxpayer money and time is wasted. These are human beings and, um, these are human beings and they're members of our community. We definitely need more outreach workers, mental health services, low income housing. Um, I think that we should definitely consider this Motel 6 project and help this issue. Um, these are, this is Santa Maria's most vulnerable population and we shouldn't turn our backs on them. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. And our, our final speaker this evening on, uh, which is on Zoom is uh, Joseph Skoda. Mr. Skoda. Good morning, Madam Mayor and City Council. Hope you're all doing well today. I'm here to address the concerns once again about taking away the parking in front of Santa Maria's Veterans Memorial Building. I know they talked about you not just closing the street, but just limiting the special activities, and special events and activities. And we're trying to figure out what some of those special events and activities are. For instance, you know, the American Legion is having a district meeting this Sunday. We're about 30, maybe 40 cars there, all the way from well, Ventura, Santa Barbara, um, San Luis County is coming down for a district meeting. The DAV, Disabled American Veterans, which I'm a part of, I'm the commander of Chapter 82, and we're, we're putting a flag day on February 14th. Will the roads be open for our guest that day? We had an oratorical contest a couple weeks ago with the American Legion. It didn't go as planned, but we potentially could have had 20 or 30 cars day. We did it by a special event. We routinely entertain birthday parties for some of our veterans, anniversary parties. In fact, one of our veterans, Korean War veteran, just passed away a couple days ago at the age of 92. We had a special birthday party for him at the American Legion Post when he turned 90. He can barely walk. A lot of our veterans need to be driven pretty much to the front door and with the walker or wheelchair to help them in. Very interesting. Now, I put out a list of a petition I started you know, about a month or so ago. I think I have 226 names on there right now. People saying, don't abolish the road. Don't take it away from us. Abolish, I use that word because you're abolishing the hopes of our veterans for a place to go that they can have meetings. Abolishing our service and dedication that we have, not to our fellow veterans, but to our community 
and tell them, well, we'll let you know if you can park. We'll let you know if it's going to be open. And that's really sad. And I know you have another deal down the street, Chapel Plaza, Chapel in Pine, the corner. You have money set aside. You're working out those fine details. And that's only three blocks away. And why just continuously build it up and leave our parking alone? That would mean a lot to us. Last year, someone stole two lecterns from inside the building, two American lecterns, American Legion lecterns. Not podiums, lecterns are on podiums. Don't know where they are. Don't know where they are. If you take away the parking in front, that's less traffic going across, making it easier for crime to happen. In fact, the uh, the parking on the side of the building a couple of years ago, someone broke into my car window where you want us veterans to park. I want you to reconsider taking away the street in front of the Santa Maria Veterans Memorial Building. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skoda. Madam Mayor, Council Members, uh, that's the end of the speakers on Zoom. Thank you. So uh, before we move on, Mr. Stilwell, any comments? Sure, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the council. So first, regarding downtown safety and mall security in particular, uh, we will reach out to Mr. White and mall management. We wanna make sure that our rangers and our police who patrol that area are coordinating well with the mall uh, security staff and management, and we'll, walk, we'll meet with them regularly to make sure that's happening, and if there's ways we can continue to improve that. There are additional tactics we have deployed, um, again, because mall security is a priority for us, as is downtown safety. And we are working with Caltrans on the surrounding Main and Broadway for public safety devices. Those have been delayed, but those will also help with security in the area. Um, regarding Dr. Weston and the water costs, uh, Utilities Department will follow up with him. I believe they may have even tonight, but we'll make sure we're able to get the information to him so he can understand and resolve uh, the water issue. Uh, regarding homelessness, that's something everyone, every one of our city departments works on. It's a priority for the entire city. We do see the need and we advocate for expanding the shelter, the Good Samaritan Shelter. They do an important role in our community and one that we support and um, value them doing. Uh, regarding the Motel 6, it's not that the city council or the city opposes it at this point. The issue the city had was to provide Santa Marians an opportunity to hear about the project and to comment on it, and Santa Barbara County has uh, agreed to do so. Um, regarding the Veterans Memorial um, Park project, uh, we are preparing, the council approved it in the budget, we are preparing a design to show the proposed changes to the Veterans Park and to have a more specific conversation with the Recreation Parks Commission, the public, Mr. Skoda, and others about the impacts of that uh, design change and what those impacts actually are so we can discuss specifics and what are changing, what things are changing and what won't be and how to resolve any or mitigate any impacts. And then um, also I wanted to, I noticed that I inadvertently um, Regarding the consent calendar, I noticed I missed um, updating the minutes to properly reflect on Jackson's title as interim library director. So I'd ask the city council to consider that amendment in the minutes item uh, 3B when adopting the consent calendar. And that's all I have. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Moving on then to the consent calendar, mm. Madam Clerk, could you please read item number three? Routine items are presented for city council approval without discussion as a single agenda item in order to expedite the meeting. The consent calendar is approved by roll call vote with one motion. These items are discussed only on the request of council members. Madam Mayor, I'd like yeah. to pull item 3B for a separate vote. 3B. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, I'd like to um, pull item 3J. I just need a little bit of um, exclamation on that one. Okay. Madam Mayor, I don't want to pull anything. Mr. Escobedo, nothing? Uh, okay, let's go to 3B. If you could read that, mm -hmm. Madam Clark. Uh, that uh, item 3B is approval of the minutes of the regular city council meeting uh, of February 1st, 2022. I just want to make the amendment that okay. was recommended by the city manager. Okay. Is so that does. A motion? Okay. Yes. Yes, that was a motion. <laughs> Yes. We got that. Mm -hmm. 
around 3J. Um, did you want to finish Do that vote? Call. Do you want to vote, vote on it now or after it's finished? Um, you have your motion in your second now, so. Okay, let's go ahead, okay. Uh, Council Member Soto? Aye. Council Member Escobedo? Aye. Council Member Waterfield? Aye. Council Member Cordero? Aye. Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. And 3J. And 3J. Um, Do you want me to read the title? Um, yes, please. Yeah, Mr. Okay. yeah, Mr. Springer. I just need clarification on my understanding with the new proposal that was passed last December, November, December for the organic waste. What we have in front of us is going to push it back to October 223 or September 223 because we're not ready for that program. Excuse me, Ms. Waterfield, I yeah. have to have you talk into the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, if I may, Madam Mayor yeah. and Councilmember Waterfield, the, the item before you tonight is in relation to Senate Bill 619, mm -hmm. and that was passed um, late last year. What is happening is that Senate Bill 1383, which was the organics um, legislation, is what we brought before Council and the City Council approved to amend the Santa Maria Municipal Code regarding diversion of organics from the landfill. The legislature, in my opinion, recognized that it was going to be difficult for all of the jurisdictions statewide to begin implementation immediately January 1st of 2022. So there are certain requirements within the legislation that the city um, currently cannot meet, and they are very specific. Um, it is not pushing back the city's implementation of the organics. We are still rolling that program out, and we've sent out notices to all the customers. But there are very, three very specific areas um, that we are sending this notice to CalRecycle to let them know the timeline for the city to implement these requirements so that we can stay in compliance with the law. Senate Bill 619 just gives jurisdictions the opportunity to specifically list a time frame to meet those requirements to keep the city from being subject to civil penalties during this year. So the three very specific items are the three container organic waste collection. So what happens right now is that we have certain uh, residential customers who do not have a green waste bin. Mm -hmm. We intend the green waste bin is essentially being modified to be green waste and organics as well. So that we need an opportunity to go out and uh, audit those residential accounts because we do not charge separately for green waste or organics. Okay. And because those canisters only go out every other week mm -hmm. with the off week being recycling, it just takes us uh, some time, quite a bit of staff time to go out, determine who has green waste, maybe they didn't roll it out, maybe they did, to make sure that we have that available as required under the new organics requirements for those customers. So that, that takes some time and we couldn't have that ready by January 1 of this year. The second um, issue is that the gray waste container, so what is uh, now supposed to just be the municipal solid waste, we are required by CalRecycle uh, to essentially audit those. So when um, our trash truck goes out and does the collection, uh, when it gets to uh, the um, landfill, when that truck dumps and there's a giant mm -hmm. truck, we're uh, required to sort through it and determine how well people are diverting organics from the waste stream and putting it in the organics bin. Oh. So, <laughs> Okay, so I, I think I'm, am I getting SB 619 mixed up with the 1383, or is it the 1383 just re- um, Giving, giving cities more of a time to get prepared yep. for so, SB 619. Yep, so SB 1383, the city is compelled to do. Senate Bill 619 gives us a little bit of cushion in time to fulfill all the requirements, and we need that for three very specific areas. And so, this is where we have to separate our food from regular trash. Yep. And So what about those that don't have a green waste because they have gardeners coming in and doing their... Absolutely. Landscape. And those are the things that we're working through with CalRecycle, and that's part of the reason that they've adopted Senate Bill 619 as the legislature in Sacramento, is to give jurisdictions an opportunity to work through this. Realistically, the Senate Bill 1383 was a rollout statewide mm -hmm. of the organics diversion, and there are certainly going to be some issues like that with various jurisdictions or, or bumps in the road, and certainly that's similar um, with for example, uh, not uncommon for commercial offices as well, where they have landscapers come out and they, they do not have or, organics diversion. So it gives us an opportunity to work through those and determine okay. how to meet those requirements. Because I didn't support that one, so I just <laughs> want to make sure I'm still on the same yeah. track. Importantly, yeah. tonight's action um, is 
notification by the city to Cal Recycle um, of our timeline to comply. So it's a way for the city to comply over to meet compliance over the time and okay. not be subject to penalties. So okay. it, it's a benefit okay. to the city. In okay. That way. That's what I thank you so much. Yeah. For thank that you for the long explanation. No, no that was good. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Waterrail, were you going to pull Jay? Uh, you know what? We can, you know, why don't I just go ahead and make a motion to um, approve the consent calendar as is, except for the 3B, which we already voted on. Okay. I was going to pull it had he not, had Mr. Springer not explained that it was a benefit to delay it, because I didn't support it in the first place. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I need second. a second. Okay, a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, can you please read? The, no, I'll read it. Can you take the roll? Councilmember Waterfield. Aye. Councilmember Cordero. Aye. Councilmember Escobedo. Aye. Councilmember Soto. Aye. Madam Mayor Patino. Aye. Next, we have a regular business item. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will consider a bid protest from RDZ Contractors, Inc. regarding a bid from Newton Construction and Management, Inc. for Chapel Street parking for the park, excuse me, the Chapel Street parking lot renovation project. And the staff report is to be made by Interim Director of Public Works, Mr. Fulgoni. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Brett Fulgoni, the Interim Director of Public Works. The Public Works Department, in consultation with the City Attorney, has taken RDZ Construction's November 26 bid protest under careful advisement. After both of our offices carefully reviewed the protest, we've determined that under the Public Contracting Code, there's no reason for us to disqualify Newton Construction's bid. Newton Construction has the appropriate licenses to self-perform any and all the work required to complete this project. Newton Construction has provided a letter dated December 2nd, 2021, which assures the city they will self-perform the items outlined in RDZ's protest. Furthermore, we have hired a construction manager, Veneer, who along with quality assurance will be on site to ensure the contractor is adhering to public contracting code. If the contractor during the course of the project uses an unlisted subcontractor, provisions exist within the public contracting code as remedies for the city of Santa Maria which may be up to a 10% penalty of subcontracting subcontract, value. We have communicated our findings to RDZ on December 6th in writing. I wanted to add that if we delay this project, the award of this project, we may also be at risk of losing CDBG funding, which is part of the funding for the project due to the uh, sensitive um, time, due to the funding, due to CDBG funding being time sensitive. In light of these facts, staff recommends awarding this bid to Newton Construction. Thank you. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Fulgoni? Mr. Escobedo? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, in, the, in the practice, uh, the, there's, um, there's some mention about that the company does have a subcontractor. Is that a, what's a, what's the status of that? A subcontractor. So there are there are listed there are listed subcontractors within the bid. Um, let's see. There was so Newton has listed uh, four different subcontractors that'll be part of their construction. So they did mention that on the application. Yeah. So within the when they submitted their bid, they listed four different subcontractors that, that they'll be using. And some of the other bidders listed, you know, various other subcontractors. So, thank you. Any other questions? Is there a representative from RDZ Contractors <coughs> present who would like to make comments? Would you like to come up to the microphone, please? <coughs> Madam Mayor and members of City Council. Thank you for allowing me to speak again in reference to our protest on the Chapel Street Park. Uh, last month I spoke on the issues which should render the low bid an unresponsive bid. Not only was it incomplete, they also listed subcontractors to perform work that they are not licensed to do. Last month each council member received a packet 
which included the response letter from the stating, stating the reasons for rejection of our protest. <clears throat> also in the packet were the inconsistencies and omissions which should render the low bidder non-responsive. Again, I can't stress enough if indeed the low bidder is completing the amount of work in-house as they stated, they should list their equipment. No equipment was listed. It's not that they forgot to, they placed not applicable. Or if this official bid doc after the fact is gonna be found not pertinent or needed, then don't include it in the official bid doc packet. As the proposals take a lot of time to put together, we ask that the city as well as the city council take this into consideration. Madam Mayor and city council members, we ask that every bid be evaluated fairly. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have, Ms. I Waterfield? do. Uh, my question is, maybe it is to our um, legal counsel, that when we accept bids and uh, we look at subcontractors, is it our responsibility to make sure they're licensed? So far, so far as the subcontractors are concerned, mm -hmm. yes, we, we make sure that they're licensed. Okay, and Pete brings up a good point in regards to the equipment. If it's not required, why do we have that listed in our bids? So so if, yeah. absolutely, please come up. I'm just yeah. trying to clarify. Mr. Fulgoni, if you'd like to come up to this podium, sure. yeah. microphone, please. So the equipment list, as it were, um, that's associated with the bid is not necessarily a requirement of public contracting code to have. It's something that we've had listed in our bids before, and it's, it's just been past practice. Um, it's not necessarily a requirement of the code. Um, so can so that just be taken out of the packet then? So the we don't theoretically, theoretically it, it could. Um, it's something that we will be requesting from the contractor once we proceed, if uh, we proceed past tonight. Um, but it's, it's not necessarily required by law. Okay, because he does make a good point that they have to go through a lot of uh, paperwork and a lot of work to get, Absolutely. Th get this fulfilled. Absolutely, and the, uh, this particular item wasn't in the original complaint that we received in the written complaint, and so um, it wasn't in the, the official bid protest, and we haven't received anything in writing that, um, that it was part of the protest either. And so, so when we awarded the bid, did they list subcontractors in that list? Subcontractors were listed, yes. Okay, there and then you, you, you did go out and make sure that they were licensed? Yes. Okay. So. I have a question. Okay, go ahead. So on that subcontractor list, can you read what they listed um, their concrete sub for? What portions of work? So Arnie Concrete Company was listed as site work and masonry. They don't have a mason license. So who's building the wall? A concrete sub or a concrete license cannot build a mason wall. And they listed them as mason. Okay, let's, um, should we get the person from Newton Construction up here then? Yes. Can answer the question? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fulgoni. Okay. If you could please give your name and the company. Hi, I'm Darren Terrazas. I'm with Newton Construction. I'm the project manager. And I originally put the bid together for this project. And to answer the question as far as who could build the wall, we have a lot of trained, skilled craftsmen that we have build walls like this all the time. So that to answer the question. Do you have to, are you licensed to build walls? I yes. guess that's the question. So yes. you do have you do have a masonry yes, uh, we have a, license. Correct. We have a license, a B license, and a C10 license. We're licensed to do all the work ourselves in-house and have many 
people employed to do that very work. We elected to have some subcontractors listed that gave us certain better prices on some of the work that we could do ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the response. And, and that's my point. You can't list a sub and then decide to do it in-house. The, 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 wrong, the wrong thing to do was for them to list a subcontractor to perform a portion of work. Well, they're not licensed to do it. Okay, I have a so, Ms. Soto has a question. Ms. Soto? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I, I'm looking at our city attorney and council. Um, my question is pertaining to the licensing. Is Does a contractor also need to be licensed for that work, or is it just the one that gets awarded the bid? Thank you, Madam Mayor, Ms. Soto. Um, the general contractor, there, there, there are levels of contracts. There are general contractors, there are specialty contractors, which are what you're hearing about, subcontractors. A general contractor can choose to do all the work himself or herself. They also can, for the purposes of the economics of the project, have certain specialty contractors do that work. Mm -hmm. That, the listing of that work is entirely within the purview of the two gentlemen that stand in front of you based on their economics. Mr. Newton has said that he intends, or Mr. Newton's company has said they intend to use the subcontractors listed. That is the only obligation and evidence that we review and support, and then we look at the billings when they come in. Mm -hmm. Our obligation and the obligation of our management team is to oversee the project as bid. With respect to a bid protest, however, if the documentation supports the fact that the subcontractors listed have the requisite license and the general contractor chooses to do something else with their own forces, that's within the methods and means of the contractor and is not subject to the protest because the protest is whether or not those, license, those listed subcontractors are licensed to do the work. We have verified they are. Thank you. So if so, if someone so Mr. Newton goes or the Newton company goes out and gets a subcontractor, changes it, but this other subcontractor is a little bit more expensive, the company loses out on their final. They're obligated to follow their net bid. income. They're obligated to follow their bid. Okay. So if they've bid it and there's a mistake or an issue, the the contractor eats the difference. That's not right. our obligation. Again, our obligation. Okay on a guaranteed maximum price is a $1.229 million contract. We will hold them accountable for that work. The question is, are the, are the listed subcontractors licensed as listed? And they are. They're not. Okay. <laughs> yes, Mr. Escobedo. So, uh, so if uh, the contractor decided to use or not the subcontractors, that's that doesn't have to do with uh, the bid, or how does that how does that work? The obligation is to list the subcontractor you intend to use, and for which you are going expecting to get paid by the city. So, again, if the subcontractor is listed uh, purported to the, the the bid in the in the items that they were supposed to be bid, then that's the obligation of the contractor to verify to us that they do the work. And we will, we will measure that. Is, is there any time where the sub, subcontractors are not used or changed, does that <clears throat> default the bid at all? After an award of contract, there are times that I have experienced in 30 years of construction litigation where a subcontractor goes bankrupt where subcontractors unable to perform the work. Usually that results in a, con in, a, in a contract amendment with an explanation of why that ha occurred. Doesn't invalidate the bid, okay. doesn't invalidate the award. Okay. It actually requires an explanation of why and verification of that explanation. The, the, job will be, uh, the, change, the price of the job will not change for the city. I, the I, job will be done 
Again, there may there may be there may be a penalty. There may be a number of other things in, in the circumstance of that. But that's not the case here because right now the case is are there listed subcontractors and is the, the general contractor going to do the work that is not incorporated in a listed subcontractor? And that statement has been made that that is going to occur, for which a C, a C license or a general contractor license is required. I, I have one question. So if I were to list a subcontractor, I'm not going to answer your question. I, I'm not asking you. Yeah. I'm asking Madam Mayor. Go ahead. So I have a question. If I were to list a sub that was unlicensed to do a portion of work, but I can do it, is that still a valid bid? Because that's the question here. You list a sub that wasn't licensed to do that portion of work that you listed him to do. But now that someone has found your mistake, now you're going to do it in-house. OK. We're, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to answer your question or respond to your question right now. Thank you. You had a question, Ms. Soto? Yes. My other question is pertaining to the contractors. Where are the contractors located from? Where are they from? Mm -hmm. um, well, they're, uh, I'd have to review the bids. but. Uh, generally, we try to get as many contractors, as local contractors, as we can because they have the best pricing. You get prevailing wage projects, you pay a lot of money for people traveling to other, from other areas outside the area where you're working from. The, uh, many of our, even though our, our construction company is based in San Luis Obispo, many of our craftsmen and, and administration and staff live here in Santa Maria. So they love it when they get a project here because it's close to home. So uh, I, I would have to l look at my subcontractor list and look at it, but typically we try to use the most local businesses that we can in every scenario that we have. And, and those are also requirements of the CDBG funding grant that mm -hmm. we're well aware of and we've, we've worked with the City of Santa Maria for 10 or 15 years of being able to do a lot of projects for you guys, which we really appreciate. And we always try to use local businesses whenever possible. And to help me understand this whole, you know, this whole scenario, it's <laughs> I do want his answer, his question answered, because it it's valid, and I I think it needs to be answered. An unlicensed subcontractor would not be allowed to be a responsive bid. We have not determined the four subcontractors that are listed in this staff report to be unlicensed. But just for in case this ever comes up again, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if a subcontractor is stated and they're not used but the general contractor decides to do the work itself, is that valid? That, that would not necessarily Again, that's after award and once the construction is ongoing and that would require an amendment to the contract. Doesn't make it invalid. Okay. It's simply so, so then that's if, usually if this changed. would happen then it would require an amendment. Generally, yes. But the difference is prior to award at time of bid, if the subcontractors listed are otherwise licensed and capable and qualified to do the work then that's not a basis to support a bid protest, which is what the ask is here. I don't know. I Legally, it's not. Yeah, okay. yeah, no, I, I understand both sides okay. of this spectrum. Any other questions from the council? None? So I'll bring this item back to the council. Any further discussion? Motion. Do I have a motion? Madam Mayor, I just wanted to let you oh, know. Oh, I'm we, sorry. We do not have any requests to speak. No requests to speak on the item. On okay. Item. I'll make a motion that we pass it as it is, uh, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you. A second? I have a motion and a second. Any um, a resolution rejecting the protest and awarding the bid to the Newton Construction? Any further discussion? If not, uh, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Councilmember Soto? Aye. Councilmember Escobedo? Aye. Councilmember Waterfield? No. Madam Mayor Patino? No. Thank you. 
Next, we have a regular business item. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will receive a presentation on the Santa Maria Fire Department's multi-year strategic plan. Chief Tuggle, good evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council and staff, uh, community that's here present, fire department members who are uh, here to uh, listen in on the presentation. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, been a busy council meeting tonight, so we'll, uh, we'll make the uh, presentation brief and the uh, time for questions uh, plentiful. Um, this is an exciting time for us, uh, for the fire department in particular, to present um, the first strategic plan uh, for the department. Uh, this is about a two and a half year process uh, that's culminated in the strategic plan, started back in 2019 with Chief uh, Champion and a standards of cover assessment. It was updated um, last year, uh, resulting in a strategic plan. Um, you have the strategic plan uh, before you, and uh, we have a brief presentation tonight. Um, the strategic plan is comprised of three components. Um, we have the mission, vision, values. Uh, we have a SWOT analysis, strate uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats uh, within the department. Um, and then the five goals and strategic initiatives that go along with that. Um, <clears throat> the, let's see if I can get this to work here. So, in the effort to uh, derive a mission statement for the department, uh, we started with a mission statement for the city. And uh, the mission statement for the city is to provide the highest quality of service in the most efficient, cost-effective, and courteous manner possible. And listed below that are the organizational values of our city. So we started with that and uh, refined the mission statement for the city as a whole to define our mission statement within the department. A mission statement the, the team came up with uh, was committed to enhance public safety through risk prevention, disaster preparedness, and emergency services. And really this mission statement encompasses all that our department does. Um, we're not just a fire department. Uh, we go to medical calls. We have emergency management functions. Uh, and we also handle fire prevention within our, uh, within our department. So we have a whole host of services that we offer to our community, not just um, going to fires. Um, we do a lot more than that. Um, after the mission, um, our vision is really about how we perceive ourselves with relation to our partners, within our relation to the community, um, and uh, our um, in, in our, our, our area. Um, we expect to be a regional leader in all risk, meaning all of the things that we do, um, provided to our community, our stakeholders, and our peers. Um, and it goes on from there. Um, and again, this vision is derived as a compilation of a team that was put together uh, within the department. And I'll get into that, who made up that team later. Um, our values. Um, dovetail nicely with the organizational values of the of the city, um, but putting others first with pride, honor, and integrity, teamwork, uh, committed to being good stewards of the resources we provided. Our SWOT analysis, and I'll go into a little bit of detail on this. Um, the SWOT analysis really looked at a, a whole host of issues, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Um, and I wanted to bring attention to in the actual strategic plan itself that uh, I believe you have. Um, I want to bring up a couple of things in each of the uh, areas. So under strengths, um, one of the items, actually the first item listed, is that many of the improvements um, that we are identifying in this plan are already underway. Um, so there are uh, weaknesses and there are threats that actually the mitigation of or the improvement of are actually already underway. Uh, some of those are outside of our department that were identified as things that impact our department, but they are already, those improvements are underway. And I'd like to, to mention um, on our weaknesses, we did these meetings in November of 2021. And one of the weaknesses that was noted was human resources not providing quality employee support. And I think it's fair to note that this is one of those areas that is was improvement under progress improvement in progress. And I'm happy to say and recognize here today that in the 
just the two months that our HR manager, Ms. Linda Lee, has been um, at the helm, many changes have already taken place to improve that support that was notified or noticed as a weakness um, back in November. So I'm really happy to say that that, to a large degree, has been, uh, um, we could see the results of that improvement. So it's good. that's an exciting thing for us as a department, but I think citywide in particular. Opportunities, uh, we noticed a lot of opportunities. We're in a very good position as the city, um, uh, or where we are geographically, regionally, or within our county. Um, but one highlight is, um, emerging technology, data collection, um, uh, the opportunity within the county um, for a change of contract at the EMS level, um, and then increased outreach to the community. We have a lot of opportunity to do that, reach out to our community, um, and uh, help improve the safety of our community. Um, and then we also listed threats, which um, uh, we are seeking to um, develop plans to potentially address. Among those are communications failures, natural man-made disasters, things like that. So moving on, um, what did the team come up with? So they came up with five goals, and um, we'll go fairly quickly through these goals and then answer any questions as needed. Um, number one is to develop an effective, let me move slides here, develop an effective organization responsive to the needs of the members in the community it serves. Um, it, within this, we actually identified, uh, we have 12, 14 specific efforts that we are seeking to accomplish to, towards that goal of creating an effective organization. Um, we're talking about internal policies and procedures, um, administrative support within the department, um, which is a collaborative effort between our department and the rest of the other city departments. Um, collaboration and communication with our other city departments such as utilities and public works, the rangers, park rangers. Um, and I think a good example of that might be uh, the funeral that just occurred uh, with uh, Mr. DeAnda. Um, a very tragic event, uh, but I think it's a good example of how we as the department worked with other departments within the city to truly recognize and um, celebrate the life of, a, of one of our local um, heroes, really. Um, and that was partly done through the collaborative efforts of our department and, and the other departments in the city. Moving on to goal number two, um, effectively manage the organization's financial and capital resources. Um, you know, we had the Council budget or goal setting last Friday, we talked about the importance of uh, fiscal responsibility, and uh, we take that very seriously on the fire department. And so we're looking at streamlining ways to um, for vehicle acquisition, uh, facilities maintenance, um, uh, utilization of the fee structure that's been afforded to us, um, looking at how we can fund the growth of the department along with the growth of the city. Um, and seeking out opportunities for additional funding resources, additional revenue resources down the line. Moving on to goal number three is effective and efficient emergency services. And this really centers around the idea of refining our delivery of service to the community at hand. And the best way we know how to do that is utilizing the data that we have along with our engagement with the community as a whole. And so we have goals set just for uh, specific to that. Moving on to goal number four is develop a safe community through, through proactive fire prevention, public safety education, and risk mitigation. And I'd like to harken back to you May of this last year with the discussion in the user fee schedule and the importance of the fire prevention division within the fire department. This entire goal is centered around the idea of prevention, education, and risk mitigation within our city. And I'm happy to say that as of today, we've hired a fire marshal. We've hired a fire inspector, and we have a recruitment going on for a second one um, to get the um, inspections that, uh, that this community deserves completed to ensure the safety of our citizens. Um, and the next project on our list is uh, assembly inspections. Um, so we're working towards that, along with the investigation capability of uh, potential arson cases. And then the last goal, um, goal number five, is provide the comprehensive training, um, 
Oops, let me skip slides here. Provide the comprehensive training and professional development to ensure our personnel are fully prepared to effectively perform their duties and responsibilities. And built into that is um, succession planning uh, to make sure that we continue to have a pipeline of well-trained personnel to move up through the ranks and staff the highest levels in the department. Um, so, <coughs> Well, glad to see that uh, they got to see the, uh, the bulk of it, but off and away they go to a, a dumpster fire here locally. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, so the, <laughs> that's them. They're off and away they go. Um, I, I want to wrap up this uh, presentation just with a, with a remark about the team. So the team was comprised of all four divisions of the fire department, um, administration, prevention, emergency management, and um, suppression or operations. Uh, we had members that have been in the department less than a year. We have members that have been with the city less than two years. Um, we have uh, the most senior person been here for over 30 years. Um, and we had a team that covered all the ranks, all the divisions. So we really felt like this team was, was uh, owned this plan. This plan is coming from within to build this department and, and help it, help our department uh, meet the needs of the community and also looking forward to um, the challenges of the growth that are ahead of us and making sure that we as a department are ready to serve the community. And I will gladly answer any questions that may, um, may be had. Any questions from the council? Mr. Escobedo. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Question, uh, you mentioned that part of the year, your duties is not just fire and there's a big portion that is uh, uh, dedicated to other uh, areas, such as yeah. the medical. Uh, do you know approximately how many uh, uh, calls do you guys have in, a, in a, maybe last year? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, actually, uh, great question. Thank you, Councilman Rescovito. Um, we went to about 10,000, went to 10,898 calls, I believe, last year, actually incidents. Um, of those, about 60% of those calls are for medical calls. Um, part of the reason that we as the fire department go to those medical calls is because a fairly large majority of the time we are the closest resource available. We are trained EMTs with um, an enhanced skill set. In other words, we have the ability to give additional um, mitigation such as blood glucose testing um, uh, to our patients, to our community, um, and we tend to be closer than the ambulance typically is. Um, ambulances typically have two personnel with a paramedic on there, um, but they are the transport entity. So typically our folks will get there first, initiate care, and provide additional staffing as needed. And a good example of that is literally today. Um, our folks out on the east side of town went to a call. Uh, it was a witnessed cardiac arrest. The individual's heart stopped beating. Um, our crew showed up first, initiated care, uh, or took over care from the, um, from the family member who started CPR. Uh, our folks started CPR, got the AED on them, on the patient, uh, continued to breathe for them. When the medics arrived, they initiated, um, uh, were able to uh, shock the patient, administer additional medications, and ultimately that patient um, had pulses back and was actually awake in the ambulance on the way back to the call. So um, really kudos to our, to our personnel, um, and it's, it's an example of, of what they do in addition to uh, the fire response that they have. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And um, here in the opportunities uh, for Santa uh, uh, Santa Maria Fire Department, you mentioned the advanced life support uh, community uh, continuity through the county and the community. Mm -hmm. what's, uh, what's, that, um, what's that about? So in the standards that cover from uh, 2019, um, uh, paramedic <coughs> level of service, which is the, the paramedicine, um, we'll start with that, was a recommended um, level of care. Now, that is... Um, that is additional costs associated with the level of training. Um, there's additional hours of training uh, needed each year to maintain licensing. There's equipment, there's things like that. But um, the community paramedicine piece 
and the contract, the EMS contract that is up for bid as of right now, um, could present opportunities where some of those costs may be defrayed and we could potentially look at a, um, an addition to our service. That's gonna, we need to do an evaluation of that. There needs to be an assessment on that, but that is, that's the opportunity that needs to be evaluated as we look forward um, and potentially increase the level of care that we can provide to our citizens. Thank you. And, and the original dispatch, because it, it talked about like region, like county, what's, uh, what's, that, uh, what's that about? The, the regional dispatch streamlining or responses? Oh, yes. So the regional dispatch, um, the regional dispatch center is scheduled to open up in 2024, um, which would involve um, all the fire and EMS, well, all the fire agencies and then the EMS portion of the response in the county. And basically, um, instead of bouncing fire resources between dispatch centers, it would come out of one, uh, which would shorten the time frames for our response time and ultimately get um, help to the, those of the call faster. Thank you. And, and just one more um, yeah. comment. Mm -hmm. I, and I asked this question because I believe that's one of, one of the opportunities but is sharing with the community what you guys do. I think that you guys do a lot of, a lot of work, a lot. And, and one, of the, one of the points, the first one is to create a social media presence. So I think that's a, that's a great opportunity for you guys to showcase what you guys do. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you very much for that. Ms. Waterfield. How many fires in 2021 did you guys get called to? Uh, well, we had, there was 41 structure fires in the city last year. Um, there's, as far as the number of other fires, uh, such as uh, nuisance fires, debris fires, dumpster fires, I don't okay. have that exact number. So right uh, the structure fires, um, how do you categorize those? Uh, one to three, with one being the less and three being just a disaster. Uh, well, <laughs> um, if we put three as like the category of maybe the Shaw's fire, which was obviously catastrophic to, uh, to the And that business. was in 21? That, that was, was for, no, that was Yeah, from, that was a long uh, time ago. That yeah. was uh, 2019, I believe. Yeah. Um, so we typically don't have a lot of threes in terms of that type of commercial dollar loss. However, um, we, of those 41, I would say probably a third to a half of those are considered you know complete losses and an example would be a uh, fire we had in uh, December mm -hmm. on Thornburg where um, a family of five home. you know lost their entire home yeah um, and uh, so we don't get fortunately we don't have a lot of them Great. but um, you know we try to what we try to do is keep those losses to a minimum uh, try to salvage what we can and and almost as importantly keep it out of the adjacent homes uh, the biggest fire we've had and it was definitely a three and you know, kind of to your point, yeah, to your scale, no, absolutely. <laughs> um, was a fire we had in Morrison in November mm -hmm. when um, we had uh, three units displaced and a number of people displaced, not necessarily from the fire damage, but from the damage to the Smoke, utilities yeah. in the building mm -hmm. that then displaced uh, many more past that. Do you still have the least dose program? We do. Is it starting back up, or is it? Did you guys discontinue it during COVID? Or? COVID was tough for yeah. it, yeah. Um, but uh, after the Morrison fire, we saw some of our least dose volunteers come out and, and really help with um, trying to capture the folks that were displaced and give them an opportunity and place to, to That's go. That's a great program. Least dose and Red Cross were instrumental Good. to providing that assistance, and I, I really get it. I have to give a, a shout out to Rosie Rojo um, from. Um, um, uh, in her work that she did because she's so well connected to those right. groups yeah. um, and it was a challenge but uh, we were able to work through some of that and ultimately within about a week and a half everybody had a place to stay well the people that do partake in the least those programs are really dedicated Very. and they want to know what they can do to prevent any type of fire and a lot of them are just as you know they're they're easy to prevent but they don't know that and so you guys have done a good job with with that been a, a, and yeah. our emergency services specialist, uh, Roy yeah. Duggar, has been uh, instrumental to keeping that program. Well, he's responsible for helping yeah. for keeping that uh, program yeah. alive through COVID, and is excited good. to get back into growing it again. Oh, good! That'll be good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. If we could make everyone run through the Listos program, it'd make your job easier, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely.
Uh, Ms. Soto? <laughs> yes, thank you. They've been, they've been fantastic, and, and really they're a conduit to reach communities where there is a language barrier. Mm -hmm. They've been phenomenal in, in helping us to reach those groups. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. My question is pertaining to the threats that was listed in the, mm -hmm. in the strategic plan. Uh, and the one that I want to ask more about or to ask you to elaborate more on is the tech failure affecting 911 communication and data. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yes, so with the technological failures, um, really what we're looking at is, um, you know, if there is a breakdown in, in the communication technology to make those phone calls. So um, PD, you know, our police department manages the dispatch center today. Um, in the regional center, it's a county-based one. Um, and so it's really identifying um, that if we don't, if citizens don't have a way to call 911, then what? And mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a little bit out of our purview, but it's mm -hmm. something to, for us to be aware of. Um, mm -hmm. You know, things like natural disasters and earthquake could potentially bring that system down. So it's not necessarily, we don't really have a fix for it in this plan, but it was identified as a potential threat. And I would, I would defer to the, the police department's dispatch plan, which my understanding is there's a lot of redundancies built into it, but um, it did come up within our um, discussions as a, you know, as a challenge, as a threat, really. Mm -hmm. My other question, thank you for that answer. Um, my next question is around the loss of morale within the department. What are some things that you as the chief, um, along with HR and the city manager's office, what are some things that you all are proactively going to be doing to increase morale within your team? Yeah. Um, I think beyond a shadow of a doubt the COVID pandemic has been a big challenge for morale. Um, we've, what we've seen in our personnel um, is that, that when they come to work, the threat of COVID is very real. It's out in the community. Um, you know, Santa Maria had the highest case count in the county, still has the highest case count. Uh, and day in and day out, our folks are going to calls where they're coming in contact with COVID positive patients. Mm -hmm. So there is that very real threat. The recent Omicron surge has really seen that that threat is extended out in the community at large. And so that threat now exists at home. So there's really a challenge of, for our folks of seeing that day in and day out and going on now, you know, two years that we've been, we've been dealing with this and our folks day in and day out are continuously going to work and like I said with the patient who, was in, who had CPR, that's one of the highest um, risk profiles that we can do is when we're basically giving air to an individual and that air is now being aspirated and thrown up into the, mm -hmm. into the ambient air of the room. And so that threat has been very real. And so the morale in the department has been, I, I give our folks a lot of credit for continuing day in and day out to go to work and respond to calls and do what they need to do. Um, so we have worked really hard to listen to the concerns, um, communicate the plans coming down from, coming from risk to help mitigate the threats within the stations and within our workforce. Um, and then furthermore, uh, I would say, having a plan going forward gives everybody something to focus on and a commitment towards the cause of building this department. And so we've really worked hard at communicating what that plan is. I think this strategic plan is a huge boost to that. The standards of cover is a huge boost to that. We just published an annual report focusing <laughs> on all the things we've done this last year and really trying to capture the successes and keep people, keep our folks focused, moving one step at a time, understanding that there's a commitment from me as the chief their battalion chiefs, city council, to move forward. So um, I think we're working really hard to, to create that, um, that atmosphere, if you will. Um, Mr. Stilwell. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the council. And to follow up on Chief Tuggle's uh, response to Council Member Soto, I'd just compliment the chief as well. I mean, all chiefs have uh, the staff and the crew and the folks on the floor doing the work in, their, in the top of their mind, but uh, Chief Tuggle has communicated with them in an effective way where I think they can see on a weekly and, and more frequent basis the the support and the effort that the chief and the chiefs 
actually um, have the leadership of the department has and the department has, I mean the city has and the council has in supporting the fire crew. So it's important for them to hear that. They hear that on a regular basis from Chief Tuggle. I compliment him for that. And I'd also compliment him on that second point he just made there about, um, I mean, we haven't had a, an outbreak at the at the fire station during this COVID event, Every which, time. you know, for me is uh, mm. quite heartening and it's amazing, but it also goes to the, uh, the rigidity, the training, and the following of the mitigation measures um, all through the department when they're dealing with folks out there with active COVID and they're responding to medical emergency, they've kept themselves safe. And I think, you know, I agree with the chief, we don't all necessarily like wearing these N95 masks all the time. They're working in close proximity all the time, so they wear them more often than maybe other city employees do. But it's you know proven to keep everyone safe and so that's a compliment to the to the leadership and to the department staff in doing that thank you sir mr cordero did you have any questions i would say all the same stuff chief <laughs> I, I think that you uh you're saddled with an impossible job and uh you've got a great team that you work with from the top to the bottom and we certainly appreciate you and the efforts that your entire agency puts out Thank you very much. Yes, sorry. Ms. One, one last question. It's not so much just a question. It was something that I found really intriguing. Was uh, objective for a around land use involvement and the general plan update. Um, the outcome that you have listed is just engagement and representation from the fire department. But um, my, based on what I'm reading, I'm assuming it. It's also for preventative measures, right? Or fire prevention. I, I mean, I'm, I would love to hear more about sure. the correlation between fire and, and land development. Right, right. Or land, um, land use. I mean, to, to kind of put it simply, as, we, as the population grows, then there's a, mm -hmm. a, a, a need for more services. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, in particular for the fire department, because our deployment is really centered around the fire stations and um, response areas in proximity to those fire stations as the if the if the city grows outward then we need to be in a position to support that um, and then conversely as the city grows upward or inward we need to have the resources to support that and the best example of that is what is the opening of engine one in 2020 uh, truck one was running just short of 3,000 calls um, the year before engine one opened and um, for a piece of equipment that costs 1.2 million dollars that's a that's not a very long lifespan <laughs> for that piece of equipment running that kind of call volume uh, so the opening of a an additional unit um, that station's still running 3,000 calls a year, but it's split between multiple units. And so what, that's, what that shows is that as the city grows in densification through ADUs and other um, land use planning decisions, the need for adding resources to existing stations also exists. So we not only have outward growth, but we have upward growth or infill growth. And so really that's what the discussion is about it. And, and you know, to the city manager's credit and to the community development director's credit, we've already reached out and, and integrated that um, need into the, um, into the general plan process. Speaking on upward growth, how high then does our ladder go? How high does the ladder go? It's a 107 foot ladder at a 75 foot angle. I believe it reaches 78 feet in the air. Goes clear to the top. <laughs> I, I, the only, <laughs> There's, the, we could ask a multiple questions, but I just wanted, one of the weaknesses here you have is insufficient water supply in outlying areas. What does uh, that mean? Yeah, so we have a, um, we do have an area on the west part of town, area nine. Um, okay, where so that's infra is, infrastructure there, correct? Right, yes, right. okay. Yeah, and that was identified in the ISO in yeah. evaluation in 2017, I think it was. As we get more people building out there, and uh, we have people that are supposed to be doing paying for that infrastructure, that'll be done. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, just yes, Mr. Uh, uh, another comment, Chief. Um, you know, uh, much of what you had to say has to do with our first responders and that first few minutes when you get there. Uh, chances of 
anyone hearing about the call you talked about earlier today are slim and none. Just a few of us here or someone that's tuned in. But in, 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 in law enforcement, you know, you, you, there's a big accident and the, the, the police go and, and there's a lot of black and white cars and sirens and things like that. So there's a, there's a, people tend to see that and they see what's going on in that side of the, of the fence. But in, in the case of, of our first responders for the fire, and very few may ever find out that, that this person's life today is still going on because of the quick action in that first few minutes. That first few minutes is so critical, and I think sometimes we, uh, we forget that and we miss it, and it doesn't get um, emphasized uh, uh, quite as much as, as the, uh, the, some of the other things that, are, that tend to be sound as though are a little more spectacular, but they're no less life than than what you folks and your guys do at, at, at great risk because they're so close contact. That's a good so point. Th thanks again for what you do and what your team does. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate that. Thank you very much, Chief. Yes, no. it's Jessica Bello. Yeah, just um, I want a little bit more clarification in regards to the, uh, what uh, was mentioned about the uh, West uh, uh, insufficiency in mm -hmm. terms of water. What's, uh, what area, how, how big is the, uh, the threat or, yeah, it, please. It's a portion of the city that's been annexed but not been developed yet. Yeah. Um, so it's it was a known it was identified in the 2017 um, I think it's 2017 the um, insurance services office um, evaluation of the city where the ISO rating is delivered to the city and it was identified as an area it, it's the the mitigation is in process I think the mayor put it as about, about, as, about as well as it can be put um, so it is there is a fix underway for it um, and. Uh, so it will be resolved. It's just a part of the infrastructure build out, the development build out uh, that will happen over time. Uh, but because it's in the city and it's an area that we protect, it's identified as an area, as something that needs, you know, we just need to be aware of it um, and make sure we're taking care of it over time. But that mean, that doesn't mean that it, in terms of the residential areas, that's not a, any risk uh, in regards to, like, there's a fire, there's nothing that they can uh, have a risk out of it? Yeah, so the residential areas that have been developed, um, according to you know, our, rule, our uh, development rules, they have hydrants, they are taken care of. Areas that we've annexed that have yet to be developed, um, there are some properties in there that don't have hydrant protection. Um, and in those cases, we bring additional engines and call for additional help from the county for a water tender, for instance. Our engines carry 600 gallons of water. A water tender carries 1,500 gallons of water. So we might we would call in for additional help to support us in those areas that are not protected by hydrants. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Next, we have another regular business item. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will consider the quarterly financial report for the second quarter ending December 31st, 2021, and budget amendments to approve operational changes to the 2021-2022 budget. Thank you. Staff report will be made by Finance Director Ms. Harvey. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, Staff, and Public. Tonight, I will briefly present the quarterly financial report for the second quarter ended December 31st, 2021. I will be primarily reviewing the general fund, including Measure U, and it, the enterprise funds. The beginning general fund balance of $10,071,000 is the unaudited balance at July 1st, 2021. Concerning city revenues, through the second quarter of the year, sales tax receipts are nearly $1.5 million or 11% greater than the first quarter, the second quarter last fiscal year. The increase in is primarily due to strong growth in general consumer goods, autos and transportation, restaurants and hotels, and fuel and service station categories. Growth in allocations from the county of, and state pools contributed to higher revenues as well. These revenues are generated by, by out-of-state sales, including goods sold online to customers within the state. 
Through December, TOT receipts are approximately 684,000 more than last fiscal year and slightly ahead of estimates by about 493,000 or 17%. The return of the Elks Rodeo and the West Coast Customs Car Show events contributed to the rebound of these revenues. Normally, the summer months produce a large portion of TOT annual revenues, but COVID has changed travel patterns, and as a result, staff anticipates TOT receipts will be received more evenly throughout the year. NHIS revenues earned in the second quarter are 469,000, an increase of 19,000 compared to last fiscal year. The vast majority of the NHIS revenues received, about 459,000, occurred in the first quarter and was mostly generated from Chevron's tank farm road project. However, Chevron has stopped delivering NHIS material to the city's landfill from their tank farm road project and its Guadalupe site. NHIS re receipts for the second quarter were less than 10,000, with the majority of that material received from Southern California Gas Company. Several new projects are anticipated to start in the second half of the fiscal year, but material from most of those projects are small cleanup driven, cleanups driven by development or vacant land and will not generate ongoing NHIS revenues. Staff anticipates NHIS revenues for the remainder of the 2021 year will be minimal and continue to significantly reduce in future fiscal years. Permit revenue is at 75% of budget, or approximately 1.6 million, and is 27% greater than the first, the second quarter of last fiscal year. The city issued 100 permits for accessory dwelling units, all commonly known as ADUs, during the second quarter, an increase of 37 ADUs compared to the second quarter of the previous year. Permits for three buildings within the Enos Ranch West Shopping Center that will serve as future locations for new retailers and dining establishments, including Boot Barn, Guitar Center, and Dutch Brothers Coffee. These are larger commercial developments compared to the developments for which permits were issued for during the pre prior year and contributed to the increase in revenue. During the Turning to the general fund expenditures, they are at 45.6% of budget and include 2 million or 3.6% in salary savings due to vacancies in several operating departments. Contracts and services is under budget by 19% or about 1.6 million because the general plan update is a multi-year contract and several other services are scheduled to occur later in the fiscal year. Staff anticipates these budget savings combined with the latest revenue estimates will eliminate the need for the $1 million leaf transfer that was budgeted to balance the budget. Concerning Measure U, through the second quarter, revenues are ahead of budget at 59.3% or about $12.9 million. Expenditures at 45% of budget or approximately $1 million under budget. Most of the budget underrun is in the fire department and is due to budget of about 1.1 million for the purchase of two fire engines. Those were planned, uh, those are planned to be done that later this year. The match portion of the staffing for the adequate fire and emergency response or the SAFER grant positions have yet to be transferred from the general fund and account for a portion of the underrun and fire. So the city attorney's office is under budget because one code enforcement officer position is vacant and another was charged to the general fund for a portion of the year. The library and recreation and parks programs continue to be somewhat limited because of COVID-19 protocols. Expenditures in finance are for the annual levy loan payment to the Solid Waste Collections Fund. Through December, 92% per, of Measure U expenditures have been spent on public safety, 4% on youth services, and 4% on quality of life. As for the enterprise funds, the Water and Wastewater Fund revenues exceeded expenditures by 811,000, about 4 million less than last fiscal year. 
This variance is due to the $3.8 million semi-annual debt service payment for the 1997 Certificate of Participation and the 2012A refunding bonds that occurred in the first quarter last year. Water and wastewater operational expenses are under budget by 8%, primarily because of fewer repair and maintenance expenses incurred to date and personnel savings from vacant positions. For the solid waste fund, expenditures exceeded revenues by about 4.2 million because 5 million was expended on the landfill liner construction and expansion project. Solid waste operational costs are under budget by approximately 2 million or 6.6%. The transit fund's second quarter revenues are less than expenditures by 63,000 due to pending grant receipts for operations and capital projects. Fair revenue through the second quarter is just over 359,000, which is about 44,000 or 23.7% less than the pre-pandemic receipts for the first six months of the fiscal year 2019-20. The fare box ratio through December 2021 is 16.6% and is based on operating expenses paid to date. In conjunction with the second quarter financial report, staff is recommending two budget amendments amendments presented for council's consideration that concludes my staff report and I'm available for questions any questions oh, thank you um, based on the current outlook um, I know that we as a council at least at the last um, planning meeting that we had on Friday we talked about um, economic and financial um, sustainability for the city and, and long term for that. Uh, I guess my question is more around the realm of if the city has um, is under budget because of staffing or or whatnot, what it, when will be the appropriate time for us to revisit what to do with those funds? Thank you. Council, Council Member Soto, uh, we are underrun primarily due to staffing, to vacancies. Um, there is a labor problem in, you know, hiring people right now is very difficult. In, it's just the labor market is really tight um, on that. And so um, as far as readdressing that, the, the funds, once we're through this year, whatever we have left, we'll go back into fund balance during our next mm -hmm. um, budget cycle. We'll be reevaluating what we, our needs are. Um, one of the things that's challenging is we need the staff. We just haven't been able to fill those positions. Right. So we have to balance that out on how that's going to work. Mm, so uh, keeping in mind that it would have to be either one time, essential, not savings, but one time it, it, hopefully it's only a one time thing. It's not where we're constantly understaffed. Right. Mm -hmm. That would be ideal. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? None? Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Harvey. You always do such a, a, such a clear report. It's so easy to understand. Madam Mayor, yes. I move to make a motion adopting the resolution approving second quarter amendments to the 2021-2022 budget for operational changes. I'll okay. second. Okay, there's a motion and a second to adopt um, the amendments to the 21-22 budget. Any other discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Councilmember Soto? Aye. Councilmember Escobedo? Aye. Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. So the next item will be a report by the city manager. And Mr. Stilwell, can you sort of start it off with what the new masking, I don't want to say mandate, the lifting of the masking, exactly what it means, because people are asking me also. Sure, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wrote that down, as a matter of fact. Um, so, let's see. So the uh, mask mandate ends tomorrow, and um, if people who are fully vaccinated and attest to such are able to not wear masks indoors, 
and per the county health order, only unvaccinated persons will be required to mask in all indoor public settings. Fully vaccinated individuals will be recommended to continue masking in public indoor settings. And that begins, yes, yeah, starting tomorrow, as you indicated. And public and private indoor settings? Public. Public, okay. Yep. And then um, as far as upcoming items, the uh, city council tonight can canceled the next regular meeting of the city council. So the next meeting of the city council will be a special meeting on March 2nd. That meeting will focus primarily on redistricting. We will have uh, draft maps for the public and the city council to review. That meeting, as the other two were, will be held off-site. This one will be held at Manami Center. If the council recalls, the, the, the schedule the council set last year was to have one redistricting meeting in each of the four quadrants of the city. Uh, we had two last year up in the north part of town. We'll have the meeting on uh, March 2nd at Manami. And then the March 15th meeting of the city council will be at Marmonte Community Center on Sunrise Drive at which point we hope to uh, again discuss maps and hope that the council will be able to adopt one at that point given all the public comment and re refining of the maps on march 2nd and that concludes my report thank you so we will hear the oral reports from the council uh mr escobedo thank you madam mayor <clears throat> i last last friday the 11 uh i believe we didn't well, I don't know if it's uh, supposed to be here, but uh, I attend the uh, City Council Goal Setting Workshop, and that's, that's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cordero. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, after the last council meeting, I did the Ben Hayes show. It's always interesting to be there with him, and he's, uh, he's, he's good for us, and hopefully uh, our community learns a little bit from, from that meeting we, we have. Uh, I, uh, I also had a meeting regarding the Elk Rodeo Queen. We're already ramping up for that. And uh, it's with the, with the, uh, with the United Way. Uh, we are, again, sponsoring a, uh, a candidate. Uh, last Friday, I attended the meeting, the council meeting with regard to the goal setting. That was also very informative. Uh, at least I thought it was, and um, it, it uh, I thought it was w well run, and, and uh, it was uh, interesting, the information that came out of it, and I, I, was, I was very pleased with, uh, with the setting. And then, uh, Madam Mayor, I have to say I'm sorry, I made a mistake uh, at the last <laughs> council meeting that we had on Zoom, and I uh, closed the meeting a little bit, with uh, uh, mentioning Jason uh, Rivera, who was the officer in New York that was, uh, that was killed. And um, I have a couple of people that pay real close attention to our council meetings, and I received some, uh, uh, I'll call it negative feedback, that I neglected to mention the second officer. And uh, it was my fault, and I certainly apologize to uh, anyone in the community and certainly his family uh, across the United States. His name was Wilbert Mora, and I was just so taken by Jason Rivera's uh, story that we heard, and yet uh, and we hadn't had any, uh, any, uh, any public input or anything on, on uh, Wilbert Mora at that point in time, and it was just kind of an emotional event for me, and uh, uh, but certainly I, I want to not uh, forget to mention that both of those uh, fine young uh, officers with uh, New York Police Department and their loss is, is, uh, is tremendous. And that's all I have. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Cordero. Ms. Soto? No item. Okay. Um, February 1st at the KUHL Ben Hayes Show. And I attended the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors meeting. On the second, did the SBCAG meeting with the SB, SBC Transit Advisory Committee. On the third, I did the weekly meeting of the key leaders unifying recovery efforts. February 5th, I did Livable California teleconference, which is deals with land use and zoning. February 6th, California Alliance of Local Electeds meeting. On the February 8th, I attended the Recreation and Parks Commission meeting. I was the only one in attendance. Hmm? 
Um, February 9th, I attended the Library Ad Hoc Committee meeting for Santa Barbara County. February 10th, did the point in time volunteer training and did the COVID-19 legislative briefing. On the 11th, did Fighting Back Santa Maria Valley board meeting and the city council goal setting. And I would agree, Mr. Cordero, that's Jan Perkins does a great job of, of pulling this all together, but I think it's the one time when we can sit down and talk because we don't have the ability to sit down, because of the Brown Act, to sit down and talk about things and thoughts that we have um, about our community. On the 14th, I did the Santa SB CAG broadband ad hoc committee meeting and the mayor's teen council meetings at Santa Maria High School and Pioneer High School. And I guess that's it. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.